Okay, wonderful. I think uh, if everybody is on board, uh, shall we start? Sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. So let me welcome our three eminent authors and guests this afternoon. Uh, Professor Badri Narayan, Director, GP Pant, Institute of Social Research at uh, the University of uh, Allahabad, uh, attached to it, but independent, I must say. Uh, and uh, and uh, Shri M.K. Raghavendra, a noted film critic, independent thinker. He also runs a journal called Phalanx, uh, an e-journal, among his many other uh, accomplishments. Uh, uh, he, he, he's a, a regular columnist in uh, First Post and various other uh, uh, platforms. And uh, last but certainly not the least, Rahul Roshanji, who has a degree from IIMC, Indian Institute of Mass Communication, near JNU, and also from uh, Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, I believe. And he right. runs uh, a, a very important... Uh, uh, I think uh, on online portal called OpEnd right now. But uh, before uh, you know, we proceed. What what I want to do, as we always do, is we want to also welcome their books. Uh, uh, all of them have written uh, new books, which are really, really highly readable and also uh, very important. They make you know important statements. Now I have two of them, which I'm going to hold up in front of me and we will request uh, uh, Badri Naranji to hold up the third book. So let everyone see these books and uh, uh, we will, uh, in that sense, launch the books and also launch our discussion on three of them. So uh, as you can see, Professor Badri Naran's book is called The Republic of Hindutva. Uh, M.K. Raghavendra's book is called Hindu Nation and uh, Rahul Roshanji this book is called Sa The Sanghi, Sanghi Who Never Went to a Shaka. So let us give them a big hand and congratulate them on their achievement, please. Thank uh, you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, going to throw this open very soon, but uh, I just wanted to say what makes all these three books special and what is also uh, in common is that none of these authors comes from really an RSS background. There have been a number of books recently by people from the RSS. One is by Sunil Ambekarji. Another book uh, is by Ratan Shardaji <coughs> called RSS 60. I have the book somewhere. And uh, similarly, a number of such books have come uh, in the recent past. But uh, none of uh, these three authors is identifiable, uh, you know, as a traditional member of the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh. And uh, all of them have distinguished careers uh, uh, in their own right. And they have found it interesting to consider this phenomenon, the rise of Hindutva politics uh, or the Hindu nation or even, uh, you know, the idea of the Sanghi. So this is what is in common. And I must say that they're all also coming to the from very different perspectives. So I'm going to say, a couple of words about that briefly and then turn it over to the authors themselves before we have an open discussion. So the first thing is that if you look at these three books, it's Professor Badri Naran's book, which is a very academic study. He's a social historian, a cultural anthropologist. He's worked in this area earlier. He had a book, if I remember right, it was... Uh... Can you please mute everyone? Please mute everybody, system analysts, subko mute kar uh, I request everyone to mute themselves, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so he had a book called, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Fascinating Hindutva. And uh, that was published by Sage, I think 2009, about 11 years ago. So he's, he's consistently observed the rise of uh, this Hindutva brand of politics. And one of his fundamental uh, theses in, in both these books, there's a continuity as I see it, is what is it that makes this ideology or this brand of politics attractive? How is it able to win elections? How does it mobilize the masses and, and the classes? And how does it cut across 
you know, the usual lines of caste, community, language, uh, and other forms of identity politics, you know. So he's done a lot of field work, and I consider him one of the most experienced as well as erudite authorities on the subject, particularly in the entire so-called Hindi belt, you know. I mean, uh, and the, both the books are, I think, uh, compulsory reading, especially for us in academics, because other than two or three other academic books, there's an early book by, uh, by my colleague, Prale Kanungo. And there's been a couple of books by Walter Anderson, Damle, and uh, so on. There's not been much academic work, you know, on, uh, on this entire phenomenon uh, of the rise of Hindutva. And he's one of the people who has done it. And uh, I must say that he's also a poet. I've known him for at least 25, 30 years as a poet as well. And if you read his books, they're full of quotations, anecdotes, poetry. In fact, uh, I, I, I still remember in fascinating Hindutva, there's a story of a bird, a very popular bird which sings in the forest, you know. And the king wants to capture this bird, saying that, you know, why should I build roads and dams and, you know, have mandraga, whatever. I'm, I'm sort of adapting it to our times. I'll just get this bird to sing so beautifully and keep everybody mesmerized. And uh, yet the king cannot trap and capture this bird entirely. So the tussle continues, you see. And the yogi also gives him some advice, you know, that uh, you have to create your own counter narrative and so forth. I don't remember it all very clearly, but it's very fascinating. So the point that I'm making is that these three books are also about the clash of narratives, okay? Uh, and and uh, and how how that is playing out, and I will uh, invite uh, Professor Badrinarayan to speak first. But let me say a few words about uh, the other two books. Now, uh, this the book, the Hindu Nation, is is really a, a sort of uh, armchair philosophers and critics' deep reflection. You see, on the rise of uh, of the idea of Hindutva and and uh, and modernity. And I think uh, if, if, if you look at this book, uh, Raghavendra is not known, you know, he, he, I mean, from what I know, you know, he's an atheist, he's a materialist, okay? He's got nothing to do with all this Dutva business in that sense. But he, he is examining it as a social, political, cultural, and religious phenomenon. And I think he's basically trying to say, you know, you can call it what you will, but you cannot dodge the imperatives of modernity. You know, if you want to belong to the modern world, you know, there are some protocols of modernity. There are some uh, minimum, uh, uh, you know, presuppositions, uh, you know, whatever these may be. You can say liberty, equality, fraternity, equal rights, habeas corpus, whatever these things are, which, which are a part of the modern worldview. Yeah. These can't be dodged. And if you want to have, you know, respectability in the modern world, you know, it's not respectability or acceptance doesn't depend on your brand of politics. It depends on how well you implement, absorb uh, these uh, fundamental qualities of a modern nation, you know, something like that. Of course, uh, he will tell us more. And I come to Rahul's book last, as I said, not least, because it's the most autobiographical book, okay? It's a book about the journey of an individual who practically starts on the other side, okay? With deep suspicion and the usual internalized, you might even call them stereotypes or suspicions about, you know, the RSS, what they stand for, and how, you know, and he documents his own journey. And then later in the book, you, you will see him as an activist, as a startup founder and all that he's in a way not all just the tip of the iceberg he suffered so much i know how he's been targeted he was arrested also false charges so you know if you take popular position in un unpopular positions you will be attacked you will be targeted and they will people will try to bring you down and uh, i i'm a regular reader of of opened and uh, I mean, I can hardly think about any story which is not properly backed up, not properly researched. And when a couple of mistakes occur, they take it down, they acknowledge it. So there are professionally 
run outfit with a identifiable viewpoint okay and uh, there's a lot to be said about this because you know even today there are people justifying what happened the 22 servicemen killed in the maoist ambush there's a whole uh, i would say ecosystem to justify certain kinds of ideologies but when it comes to the other side there's not much other than branding you know you call somebody sanghi fascist chaddi whatever it is so these are facts and we have to we have to uh, if not counter at least interrogate you know some of these uh, mechanisms that are unleashed upon people who take uh, somewhat unpopular positions so uh, once again i think very accomplished authors and very important books uh, i will now ask uh, each author to speak for about 7 minutes on their book I mean, they can speak for two hours, I know, but our time is limited and we want a more lively discussion. So about seven minutes, uh, you know, try to, uh, if you can, encapsulate what, what you try to, uh, you know, accomplish in the book. And uh, then I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. And I'm happy to say that after, after we finish our live uh, program, our book discussions have become so popular on YouTube and uh, on Facebook that, uh, and, and we are also putting them out on the direct to home broadcast of, of Doordarshan. So students are going to see this program and I hope that they will find it interesting and also provocative so that they can think for themselves, you know, and, and try to find out as responsible citizens, as interested uh, voters, uh, as well as people who love democracy, people who love India, want to make this a better country, to, to join the debate, to join the discussion. So with these words, uh, let me request Professor Badri Narayan to start off our discussion. S sir, please, please, sir, unmute your mic. I am unmute you. You have to unmute Thank you, uh, Makaranji, and thank you, IIS Shimla, for organizing this book discussion and providing this Achha, space. Ja, 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 just one, one little note. I don't want to interrupt, but I must say we are also very proud to remember the fact that Professor Badri Naran was a fellow at IIS. Yes, yes. I, ja, I forgot to mention that. So we are welcoming you, you back home in that sense with, you. with your new accomplishment. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Thank you, JJ. So, uh, and I also thanks to Risha. Risha is here, who is the editor of Penguin, and she worked with me uh, in the entire journey of making this book. And uh, then I'll start my uh, whatever I have to say. And, uh, and, and the last but not least, thanks to the, uh, my, my f uh, people who helped me in the field to write this book. They are the real, a real author of this book. I am co-author of this book. So, so I'm thankful to them. Uh, let me begin with one of my uh, experience, which I felt after public publication of this book. Uh, and I realized that what her author has to always contest with his own image. You know, if you have made an image through your writing since 20 years or 30 years, and you're, you're going to say something new, and you will have to fight against that uh, image itself. And people will put you in that block. And they always say that why you were saying like this, How, why you were not saying like that way, the similar way. So people always want to listen in this in their according to their habit. And if you want to break that habit, then it is a big struggle. And and that you can see in the public sphere when you will get response on the book. Second, which I already said that that uh, uh, whether there is a space for academics, a gray space for academics in this country or not. Uh, black and white, right or left, uh, there should be a space and the freedom to tell what we observe during our history. And, and, and we should allow the author to tell, you know, at least patiently listen, patiently read. Uh, don't, don't always comment on the Facebook and the, and the social site and abuse the author. So that can, I'm not going to tell many <laughs> stories. I'm just going to focus on the book. But this is the uh, backdrop of the of the experience of one month when after uh, this book uh, published, and and I, I received very good comments, very good uh, no appreciations I'm receiving from the part of for the country. 
but still uh, the, the things which you heard you will tell more about that and those who gives you pleasure and happiness you don't tell about that that's why i took two minutes to tell about them uh, and and then say, uh, say about this book as as makaranji rightly said that i am observing trying to observe uh, the politics of hindutva since uh, even 1994 when uh, in my uh, when bsp started actually i started working on dalit movement and in that process i observed that there is a hindutva movement is also going on so so hindutva movement and bsp and dalit movement bahujan movement both we are going together in the hinduism uh, you can remember around 90s and uh, uh, bahujan movement we worked a lot on that and uh, and and, and the similarly at the same time we are seeing that the another hindutva movement hindutva movement is growing uh, side by side so and both we are taking uh, learning from each other it's very interesting like if you see the the format of the mobilization of the hindutva movement you can uh, you will be surprised to know that they have learned many things from the bahujan movement mostly the icons produced by the bahujan movement they are being retold by uh, hindutva movement in its own way so so there is a no contra, uh, there is a there is a similar uh, movement of two, of two social movement or political movement rather you can say uh, is online uh, nowadays and hindutva movement is going so question comes in our mind that why is happening and with this question i went to the field and and uh, and i used to go to the field and i saw how among dalits and marginals uh, uh, sang is uh, is slowly slowly uh, expanding its base and what we observe that is not only the mobilization it's entering in the social bhav i used to care for social bhav in social bhav on which the mobilization take place social bhav is invisible and hindu movement not only among dalits this entire Uh, in the bigger uh, community of uh, hindu belt you can see uh, there there are hinduism there are hindu bhav but by i i observe them dalit and mar how they are entry and and how they are uh, uh, synthesizing uh, all the opposition oppositions you know, uh, trying to reduce uh, dilute the oppositions reduce the oppositions trying to uh, synthesize of uh, synthesis of opposition can you unmute please can you unmute sunai nahi de raha aapki awaaz nahi aa rahi hai badri ji someone uh, yes and uh, now you are listening yes so uh, so dalit and marginals we are projected by ambedkarites mainstream ambedkarite discourse as anti hindutva or anti uh, uh, hindutva group social groups although it's not true only a, a smaller section of dalit and marginal community those who are educated and those who are uh, they are uh, those who are influenced by that kind of radical ambedkarite school they, they think in that way but the most of dalits and marginals have their uh, uh, desire of religious uh, equality and religious equality to become uh, like someone who is respectable in the religious sphere and hindu is respectable uh, so they want to become hindu uh, they want to recognize themselves as hindu so so uh, and that uh, uh, urge sang real uh, experience and they responded to the to that urge uh, second thing is uh, and 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 uh, uh, mostly this entire liberal um, uh, discourse they used to see uh, 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 they usually talk about socio economic equality but they don't talk about religious equality they ambedkar talked about religious equality but after that 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 a uh, stream could move but now sang realized this requirement of marginal communities 
that they have also aspirations of their own a temple of their own local deities. They want their own religious spheres, and 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 they don't have capacity to make that uh, religious spheres. So Sang appeared to help them, to work with them, to provide them a religious uh, identity. So dignity and development, dignity through religious uh, historical icons, icons mostly explored explored by Bahujan movement, uh, Daldev Pasi, Baldev Pasi. Um, uh, so many Suhal Dev, so many uh, um, uh, icons which, which were explored once by BSP movement, now retold by, uh, um, by, uh, by Hindutva movement in it, their own way. And in that process, they are trying to, to, uh, to reduce the casteness of the community and convert it, to, it, it in, in the mega Hindutva uh, frame. And that's a big struggle which is going on uh, among Dalits and marginals in, in, in uh, Hindi region. Second thing is what I observe that in this process, a new RSS is uh, become visible to me. I experience a new RSS. Why new RSS? It may be not new for someone, but why it's new for me? Because I was looking that RSS from my own stereotype, which emerged in my mind, uh, like in, uh, like in uh, facilitating Hindutva. Uh, I uh, documented the entire process, how they are working. But uh, my language was communal. My language was uh, militia, you know, this kind of thing. So what I realized that the entire notion of communal is now changed. Uh, communal rights don't need communal rights now. Because Hindutva social bhav is so pervasive. And, and, and uh, it's, it's entered in your Hindutva common sense form your common sense. So why do you need communal rights? No, already the community is mobilized. Only you say uh, Kabristan and Khali, uh, Kabristan and Ismasan, people will be moved. So only phrase is, is, uh, can work more than any communal rights. So how do you need communal rights? So the entire notion of communal right has been changed. Uh, this is the one. Uh, so, so many, like Brahminical, uh, RSS is Brahminical party, uh, Brahminical organization. Yes, it was true in 30s and 40s or 50s. They used to bring uh, Brahmin, uh, the, the, the Prasharaks from Maharashtra to work in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. But now they have a big human network, no? Uh, and, and most, and, 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 and you will be surprised to know that Dalit and marginals are participating in a big way in their politics. Uh, politics, you can say or not, in their mobilization process. Uh, they, they don't say the caste of the Pracharak. But if you go in the field, you will know that this person is from that caste from that caste. So the entire profile is being changed. Third is uh, modernity, you know, a kind of modern, uh, the entire uh, 90s when liberal economy came, liberal economy affected the entire country, the entire process of development. Why RSS can't change that process? Why we are uh, negating both? Any extreme right says, no, no, RSS can't change. It is the same, we were the same. Uh, extreme left says, no, no, RSS can't change. RSS is the same, RSS can't, RSS change hoi nahi sakta. So, so, but when everything is being changed in the influence of 90s liberal economy, why not RSS will be changed? They are also like organization of the human being. So, so I, I documented the changes which appear in the RSS due to the, the influence of the democracy, market, development, and the, and the uh, liberalization and globalization. And in that process, now you can see uh, RSS carders on Twitter, RSS carder with tab, RSS carder of the SUVs, RSS carders uh, uh, working with various modern ideas, homosexuality, gender, and all, their interaction with the diaspora of the world, and those diaspora also influ influencing their making of the uh, ideas. And they are, uh, they are taking various forms of the organization from there. Online shakhas came from the, their experience in America. And, and, and not only they only influence, uh, RSS only influencing them, they are also influencing RSS. So, so in various ways, the, it's like the various uh, windows they have opened and the peers are coming and they are, because they, they have to expand, they have to grow. And those who have to grow, uh, Ranjit Guha was a very eminent Marxist historian, subaltern historian, and he used to say about America that, you know, America has a, very strong appetite. They can they can appropriate anyone, 
and that is strength makes you great tradition if you are imbibing everyone including everyone uh, so so in that way rss is is uh, trying to uh, to to include or appropriate their opposites and and to, to for that they are redefining themselves at any level no at any level i used to say that uh, that maybe i may be wrong and makranji may correct me that rss has no fundamental in that way uh, fundamental means the fundamentals which make you fundamentalist no uh, fundamentals of uh, no the, the, they can redefine it themselves time uh, in based on the changing time uh, recently mohan bhagwat also said that now time has changed so we should forget uh, something from the bench bunch of thought where we are stuck so selective forgetting is one of i have also discussed the strategies how they are working selective forgetting uh, invention of tradition and also so many uh, devices which i have used in that process so field and i have tried to see the field from my own uh, in uh, views uh, and i had a big struggle for myself how to counter my own stereotypes so i am going to uh, and in the last uh, one minute you know the last chapter which is on for covid time and the uh, rss work uh, how the bio public is has, has is, uh, is being immersed into the uh, this corona condition and that bio public is uh, uh, created a rupture in the making of hindutva public because i i am facing the making of the hindutva public longer durée of making of hindutva public because uh, the, the concern of bio makes you self centered but rss worked with the community even in the corona time and create forced a link and that link may they can uh, they can revive when the time will be settled to again begin the project of making of hindutva public so 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 this book documents longer durée of making of hindutva public longer durée of making of hindutva politics and i have tried to document uh, processes no i have not given any value judgment i have tried to restrain myself but you know it's very difficult to remain neutral because people will not uh, leave you to become uh, neutral and i am really thankful to ias you know my my english writing in english begins from the ias before that i used to write in hindi first book i wrote in is documenting recent contesting fable contested memory and the political discourse in is so is provided me time to to increase my uh, expression to write a book in a research book in english so thank you uh, is thank you makranji and here i am going to stop thank you so much uh, uh, thank you so much padri ji uh, you know you were hinting at uh, a number of things and i want to simply speak them out which is that in the first book right in the uh, you know initial chapters he takes a seemingly anti hindutva position and uh, in that sense he got branded for it though he's an academic and now in the new book i think there's a greater appreciation if not admiration for all the processes he mentioned of appropriation the interpenetration of opposites learning from the dalit movement and uh, i think badri ji was the first one to talk about suhail dev and bharech now amish ji has written a whole book on it but he documented it how a hero was made a myth was created and uh, the last chapter in fact it's not a chapter it's an epilog is about the biosphere and the pandemic so it's a it's an up to date book but if i were to encapsulate what i think is its greatest achievement it's an attempt to capture a new i would call it a new sociality uh, a hindutva sociality the making of a public sphere and what are the elements that uh, that go into its making and i think he he said it he said that you know it has a digestive capacity the hindutva movement has a digestive capacity which can you know keep including things which seem to be totally uh, opposite to uh, to its fun foundational though he says there are no yeah, i wouldn't say fundamental but foundational ideas and the capacity to change reinvent itself and uh, uh, i would say if you ask me uh, i would uh, i would say that uh, one of the things they will not compromise on and this will bring me to to raghavendra is the idea of the uh, you know unity of what they call hindu society they will not compromise on that so for that unity they can keep on absorbing 
contradictions or differences. So with those words, let me now come to Raghavindra's book. As I said, it's a very deep reflection on the idea of the Hindu nation. And, it, and can it be reconciled with modernity? And uh, in a way, I think uh, Raghavindra is saying, you know, you can call it a Hindu nation, but uh, to be modern, it has to have, you know, those elements. And he also says that inherently there's nothing wrong with the Hindu nation because the Hindu nation is not an exclusive construct. It has room for all kinds of differences. The religion is also not one book, one prophet. But, you know, that's only one half of the story. Now, you can tell us the other half, Raghavendra, all, all yours now. Thanks, Makaran. Thanks, thanks, thanks to Makaran IAS for uh, inviting me to speak here. Uh, this book was, uh, you know, was prompted primarily by the hostility which I see in the public space between uh, forces of uh, liberalism, what type of self, uh, self self liberalism, and uh, those forces of the right, of the right wing in the world, what is called in the world, right? And it's, it's as if though both of them exist in democratic society with no doubts about the validity of the election, it's as if they can't talk to each other. Families are split in this way. There are uh, the brothers don't talk to each other, sisters don't. After this book came out, after this book came out, one of my nieces asked my son if he had ostracized me yet. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the point is, so the, the situation is pretty bad, and uh, it's basically, as you say, you know, these uh, these uh, the this is liberal. So the, how the liberal defines himself is that. Um, they're basically Hindu, you know. The fight is not between Hindus and Muslims or Hindutva and Muslims, but rather between those Hindus who regard themselves rational, secular, secular defined in the Indian way, which is very different from secular as we understand the term, and uh, and these uh, and the, the minorities themselves are not uh, protesting in any way, not in any way. They may vote this way or that way, but there is no great protest. Okay, so I I. I interrogated this thing, examined the entire process, and it seemed to be that uh, it came out of the way India defined itself after 1947 with emphasis on science, technology, rationalism, right? And the question is, it seemed to be that uh, in Indians were invited to embrace skepticism in some way, right? We had to become skeptical in some way. You have to become rational, skeptical in some way. And I myself was brought up in that. I was brought up in that way. That is, uh, that is, I'm an atheist. I've always been an atheist. But the point is, that does not mean that people outside this are not entitled to believe, not entitled to belong. After all, you know, let us, let us say something, right? Uh, religion is not only a matter of practices. It's a matter of identity, which become more and more, right? And in the same way, liberal in India is also not a not a not an intellectual process that one adopts, but also an identity, a political identity. Okay, who where you vote, who you protest against, what actions are uh, acceptable, that sort of thing. Okay. So then I I looked at this uh, thing and I began to uh, sort of by speculating and began by speculating on Hinduism, what Hinduism is, uh, does it have a unifying? Uh, seems to be. That my own thing, understanding it is, I mean, understanding uh, the various ways is that it seems to be a series of conflict and negotiation. Okay, over 2000 years, there's a series of conflicts and negotiations in this space. You know, the word Hindu is not based on, not internally defined, but externally defined based on the space it occupied, as seen by invaders, as seen by people outside, right? Okay. So Hindu, the Hindu Kush mountains would be where Hindu, Hindu is the main thing, and that sort of thing. This side of the Indus would be the basic thing, right? So the, so what I thought was that if Hinduism is a series of conflicts and negotiations, as uh, Professor Badrina Rai said, they go on absorbing new things, go on changing things. A perfect, like for example, the original Brahmin thing, right? To take this of Brahmin, okay? That would be the Aryavarta. Then your Buddhism and your Jainism developed outside that in the Magadha and those areas outside Aryavarta. So the question is, there was opposition, but at the same time, 
there was, uh, see, for example, if you look at the, the notion of heterodoxy, are you able to uh, hear me properly? There seems to be an echo. I'm getting an echo. Okay, all right. Okay, this heterodoxy, this heterodoxy is basically includes things like materialism, it includes things like Buddhism, it includes the Ajay, uh, Ajay, what, Vikas, I don't know, Buddhism, Jainism, all that, okay, Ajay Vikas, yeah. All of them, it includes all of them. The point is, all of them in today's context would be, should be, shall we say, welcome within the ambit of Hinduism, right? They should be, I mean, in the sense Hinduism is not only a certain set of following of certain gods, they should all be welcome within the ambit of Hinduism today. This is my, my sense. Okay, once you do this and you define Hinduism as that, as, and not only that, I, I, I am very distrustful of this unification uh, processes, you know. Unification is basically a way of a hegemonic influence to gain control of the whole thing, right? Okay, so if you say that uh, Hinduism is Vedas, it becomes Brahminical. If you say, uh, say uh, the, the Bhagavad Gita, then you exclude the Shaivites, okay? But the question is, you want all those people in, in, in the, in the Hindu in the Hindu, the Hindu nation who would otherwise would be excluded under our, what you call orthodox or caste Hinduism, right? So this would go along with uh, what uh, Professor Bhavinarayan said about uh, what the RSS is trying to do now. That would be the right way. Okay, then this is my basic thing, okay? Now, Nehru, along with Sukarno and Nazar, okay, started this thing of saying that uh, Hindu, that, that the religion should not be a way of defining national culture, but rather it should be the nation itself should be the object of loyalty, right? This is the basic thing. All of them have fallen, okay? Uh, uh, this uh, Nazar's uh, Egypt has become Islamic, Sukarno's uh, Indonesia became Islamic, with a lot of repression as well, right? The only reason India is more closely with the Nehruvian ideal, though they're also fading away, is the fact that this is Hindu. Okay, Hinduism is, is, is a thing which allows various things. It doesn't, it doesn't usurp the space, doesn't usurp the space, doesn't demand. So the question is, because of all these, India has been truer Nehruvian principle than uh, Egypt was to Nazarian principles or uh, Indonesia to Sukarno principles, right? This is the basic thing. This is my sense, okay? This is my basic thing is that, but the question, and what has happened is, what happened after this is, that Indian academics, intellectuals, after 1947, because they were invited to, to imbibe this uh, rational thing, and they're the ones who took Hindu, Hindu thought and Hindu thing to the West, they approach Hinduism with a certain skepticism, and that skepticism seems to have been uh, absorbed by the West as well as the right way to look at Hinduism. Okay, so what has happened is the kind of uh, the, the shall we say the kind of press that Hinduism gets. I don't mean I don't mean Hindutva. The kind of press that Hinduism gets, okay, is not good. Okay, it's not. It's it's actually the sneer of it, right? And even specialists on Hinduism, for example. If you look at uh, Donegar, you look at Donegar, some of it, I find that there's a lot of sneering. It is as if the religion is an occasion for wit. Okay. I don't think, I don't think this could have come about on its own, especially in, 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 a, in a politically, in a politically correct milieu. Okay. My sense is that since, in, since Hindus themselves laugh at Hinduism, okay, it is, it is it's a natural object for, uh, for humor. Okay. This, this is the basic thing. This is the basic sense I got out of it. So the, the point now is, but the but the question is, how do you do this? So recently there was this thing about this woman, Audrey Dreske, I think, Dreske, okay. So she objected to the fact that she was going along all this time saying things, I don't know, I've not read the book, uh, that all this time she said that nobody took exception, but now suddenly there are people trolling her, right? This is the basic thing, right? This is the basic thing. And she was also exonerated by her. But the point is, all this time, people were laughing with her. Now it, it now it looks like they they are not prepared to laugh anymore. Okay, because when other people don't laugh. Okay, other religions don't laugh. The Jews don't laugh. The Muslims don't laugh. The Christians don't laugh. Nobody laughs. Okay, and you know within India itself, within India itself, okay, you won't find so many so many non-believers among the minorities that you find among Hindus. Okay. You won't find so many of them. 
So the situation is you've got you've got this uh, thing and you've got you've got to deal with it in some way. But the point is that you need an intellectual climate among Hindus. And I, I don't know how I was seeing from outside, I get the feeling that Hindutva is generally anti-intellectual in some way. This is a sense I get. Okay. And you have to integrate with the world. You have to talk about things. You have to talk and you know, it's this this entire thing of uh, of uh, you know it's of, of local knowledge should be valued. Our local knowledge, local local knowledge about Hinduism, you know, who who holds the thing about uh, Hinduism. Is usually, I mean, in India, it's all it, about Hinduism, about Sanskrit, about law order. The people associated with the religion, right? These, these are these are things which can be studied objectively without without the involvement of religious personal personalities, right? So this is what I'm saying, and my point is that uh, this thing of modernity, you have to embrace modernity. India has to integrate with the rest of the world. Your uh, your your things have to be defended in some way. Your things have to be argued out in some way. An argument is something you have to learn from the West. Okay, it is something that argument which is valid in the West. It's not something which you get. You get a lot of anecdotal evidence in uh, in Indian kind of writing. I'm mean, not not I'm talking only about in Indian writing in English. Okay, but you don't get so much argument. And I think you know my my book is fully shall we say reference. Largely with those liberal sources, okay, Western sources, and trying to make this out with their sources. I'm not looking at Indian sources, okay, because I want to say if you make, if I can make this point with your information, with what is valid in your case, I'm making a perfect point. So this is this is my uh, my approach to the whole thing. But as I said, you know, what has happened is there are Christian nations, there are Jewish nations, there are uh, Islamic nations. They're all valid, so we cannot take this notion of Hindu nation. As far as I'm concerned, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, any person who calls himself, who does not exclude himself, see the, the first time I believe the word Hindu was used was by by Muslim rulers and their followers who said that whoever was not converted to Islam was Muslim was Hindu. That was supposed to be the, the reason. So you are you defined by who exclude by whoever excludes you. Okay. So it's, it's not a great difficult thing to imagine a Hindu nation, but it has to be modern, it has to integrate with the world, it has to embrace principles which are accepted. See, for example, you take something like Dharma, it's very difficult to define that. Okay. Some great work has to be done with these Hindu notions, try to relate them to internet world notions. What are the things, human rights and all these things, you know, equality, egalitarianism, all these things have to be integrated with this. Okay. So this is basically my, this is my thing of my book. It reads actually, the second part of the book reads like, you know, a Leninist, uh, um, what is to be done, okay? It's a kind of manual on what uh, what the Hindu nation should do to, to integrate with the world, education-wise, this wise equality-wise, bringing all those values which are internationally accepted, globally accepted, okay? This is my basic thing. As I said, this has been welcomed by many people. They've taken it very well. But many people have been very hostile to it. I've, I've been unfriended on Facebook by quite a few. Yeah. Okay. That word Hindu nation. Okay. It itself is anathema. It's an anathema to people. They don't want to look at it at all. And uh, their, their, uh, their basic thing is, and I've been blurb at the back. I've written Hinduism, some Hinduism take its place in the world with pride as some kind of propaganda. Okay. And one of my, as I said, my niece wanted me ostracized. So I mean, as I'm saying, it's a, it's, it's a question of uh, basically looking at the, the, the entire notion of Hinduism. Hinduism. Is it possible? How, how does one do it? And of course, there are there are impediments within the within the within the forces of Hindutva itself. Okay, there are pre-modern elements within uh, within Hindutva. Okay, these pre-modern elements have to be the party has to be uh, the. The Hindutva forces have to somehow grab, grab hold of it and uh, welcome intellectuals into its fold. Try to, you know, that they have to take. They have operated at the lower levels, grassroots levels, but they seem to be shunned the higher levels. Okay. So the result is the higher levels fell, uh, they spread, uh, what do you say, information about them, and uh, which actually dominates world opinion in many ways. So this is my thing. And as, I, as you said, it's an armchair book. It's written now based on reflection on the day. It has no knowledge of grassroots, grassroots level. Uh, 
So having said this, and thanks, uh, I, I is once again and conclude my talk. I hope there's too much echoing. I was echoing too much. I hope it is all right. Oh, thank you, thank you, MKR. We could hear you perfectly, okay. and uh, I, I like the way you began. That uh, you know, there are two aspects to the way you see who a Hindu is. In fact, you have a chapter here on who is a Hindu. But what I liked is you see Hindu itself as a space of dialogue, conflict, accommodation, uh, you know, pushback, and so forth. And that's reflected in your own family, like your niece is asking yeah. if your son yeah. has ostracized you, you know. <laughs> in other words, what I'm trying to say is I've also argued for the last 10 years that uh, the so-called uh, clash of narratives in India is not between Hindus and others. It's a civil war. You know, in fact, in my forthcoming book, I call it the uncivil war because civil war has a connotation of people, you know, going around killing each other. But this is a battle which is happening in the drawing rooms, of every, so to speak, Hindu home today, you know, and I just want to refer the audience to one line in your book uh, from the chapter, Who is a Hindu? And you say, a Hindu nation would hence include all those who do not choose to exclude themselves from it. So I think this is a very interesting definition because you may be an atheist, you may be a materialist, whatever, but you don't exclude yourself from the identity tag of Hindu. You're comfortable being a Hindu. And I think this is the this is the essence of it. Now, the second thing you say, I think, is very, very important. That it's not enough to win a battle in social media and have more trolls paid or unpaid than the other side. You know, you you have to do a lot of work, which is based on evidence, deep understanding, even of the West. I mean, as you said, most of your uh, references are, you know, to the West, the makers of modernity in the West. But we can't simply abuse somebody and hope to get away from it. And the last thing I want to say is you're absolutely right when you say that, you know, if you see a movie like PK also, you know, Hindu deities are an object of ridicule. <coughs> Excuse me. And you have to be very solemn about other religions, other figures of respect or authority. And somehow that's changed. And that uh, if you are going to be sneering anymore about some of these uh, uh, figures of authority or respect, it's, there's going to be a pushback. We saw it with uh, the case of Ms. Savant, who was elected as the president of the Oxford Union and then cancelled. And, uh, and uh, would, it be, would it have been the same if someone had, in her place, had been sneering let's say about, you know, Hindu deities or Hindu practices or offensive comments on caste, it's very doubtful that she would have been cancelled and forced to, to get out. I think you will be cancelled if you say things about maybe trans people or about, you know, some politically correct uh, things or, or maybe Islamophobia, but you're not yet going to be cancelled if you, you know, make all kinds of comments, as in fact, Dr. Sarkar did, which brings me right to, uh, uh, to Rahul Ji's book, because, uh, you know, he's got a very interesting, uh, you know, chapter here, which I was looking at, and uh, he calls it the sore losers, you know, and this refers to the 2019 victory of Narendra Modi. So when you lose in a so-called civil war, there are two kinds of losers, as our MKR, you said, that when are we going to start talking to each other? But I think, I think what Rahul Ji is establishing is that the other side does not want to talk. You know, they'll keep on othering you, calling you non-democratic, whatever it is, fascist. So I think this is what uh, we have to really contend with, that uh, when you win a game fair and square, you're supposed to at the end of the game, walk to the middle of the pitch or wherever you are, shake hands and say, well played. Now, why is that not happening? Why is the other side not saying well played? Rahul, you can tell us why. Uh, first of all, uh, obviously, thank you, uh, IIS and uh, Makarandaji and everyone else who has joined for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, it's an honor. 
and uh, before i start i would like to make one correction uh, you know in in very uh, beginning of the this event you had said that i was arrested also because of my views so i i should you know just to keep the facts on table i, I was not arrested it was my editor nupur sharma uh, and she was also not arrested in a way but uh, there was a case by uh, west bengal government uh, that is mamta banerjee's police about uh, you know various stuff it, it was mostly about reporting of covid you know so so it's it's actually such a uh, weird and funny thing that it it was not even about ideology see to i mean when when we are saying that covid situation is bad in uh, bengal it, it had got nothing to do with ideology as such and yet uh, i must correct arose. myself all, all, almost arrested in the sense that she yeah, was called and, to the right. station she was called to the police station harassed right you know interrogated right. so i correct myself but almost arrested go yeah. ahead sorry sorry right right so she was interrogated on onto on the camera and i was also made uh, you know a co accused but supreme court gave us a relief before that so that's just just to you know uh, make the facts uh, uh, in order uh, now regarding the book as uh, uh, we were discussing earlier uh, and you know on onto the point that where you left that why is the other side not saying well played and uh, moving on now that's 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 precisely something i mean uh, this this is exactly what figures in my book as well uh, which which uh, comes into the later chap chapters uh, the book definitely was not about why they are not saying well played because that's a realization that happened to me much later uh, around 2018 or so so uh, you know this this whole uh, uh, zone of being so polarized uh, it, it, it appears as if those who called modi divisive or modi a polarizing figure uh, they were already decided that they will make sure that uh, you know it's almost like a self fulfilling uh, fulfilling prophecy that modi has to be proved that he is a polarizing and a divisive figure so it uh, those those signals perhaps which someone like uh, uh, me could not pick up early was uh, those signals were always there right right from the point when narendra modi looked like um, the most uh, probable candidate who, who could be made the prime ministerial candidate to his official announcement that he would be the prime ministerial candidate in 2014 the narrative has gone only shriller i complete uh, you know and this this uh, features in my book also i think quartz was uh, or uh, i'm sorry if i'm forgetting the publication but uh, uh, a head uh, an opinion article was titled that india crosses point of no moral return if it chooses modi now when you are coming from that kind of uh, uh, you know uh, stated position then you have already decided that uh, you are not really going to say well played you know and th that's a realization i i it, it dawned upon me much later uh, and unfortunately it was not just about two or three people who who would be in that uh, extreme zone where they are they, they have made the entire uh, point of uh, uh, an electoral victory they they turned it into an existentialist question so that was something i was not expecting you know uh, and and this this uh, features in my book also that people like us uh, we i mean although initially i was not at all interested in politics and ideology i come from bihar as 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 a as someone who is born and raised up in bihar your average interest in politics in any ways higher than the rest of the country at least that's what we we biharis pride themselves to to you know be having and i think that's true also but still even by by the bihari standards i was not really too much into politics or ideology now for for people like us and i would say i would say that for most people uh, uh, or the most citizens of india electoral politics was also like that you know what you are saying it's it's a game of cricket you know we are also passionate about cricket we we uh, you know on occasions we start abusing and fighting uh, because of our favorite cricketers uh, and then we forget it you know i mean a, a cricket match happens uh, if our team if our favorite team or if our favorite players wins or performs well we celebrate or or you know maybe we drown ourselves into sorrow if it was a really bad match and then the next morning we are ready for a new beginning now that new now that's that's how many people like us treat politics also you know and that's where 
uh, Makaranji, even perhaps you are uh, coming up with uh, with an idea that just say well played, you know, just like at the end of the cricket match, you shake hands and yeah, it's all over. Uh, a little bit of post-match reaction, analysis, commentary could go on, but you life goes on. That never happened. That never happened with a set of people uh, who identified themselves as liberals, as secular, as as uh, you know, guardians of our morality, as people who want that India will cross a point of moral no return, you know. So, so that never happened with uh, with uh, you know this this section. They were not ready to say well played because it was not a game at all for them. Now, this is uh, this is this is something that I realized uh, maybe around 2017 or 18, and this this book uh, also around the same time I I decided to write around. In fact, there is a tweet of mine uh, of from August 20, uh, 2018, when in, uh, you know, in, in, in rather a half serious manner, I had uh, tweeted out that I am planning to write a book that why I changed my position, you know, from, from a normal guy who is uh, not, not really vocal about Hindutva or about liberalism or anything. I mean, uh, for those who don't know, I, I also founded uh, the news satire website called Faking News. Uh, which was later acquired by uh, Network 18, and then Network 18 was, uh, was acquired by Reliance. Now, faking news, it was about humor, satire. It was, you know, it was about, uh, po obviously, some bit of politics was also there because political humor is uh, a very legit genre and it works. Uh, but it was all about, mostly about your daily life humor, uh, uh, social humor, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, from uh, writing or rather, forming that kind of uh, of a platform to be associated with op india which which was dedicatedly and avowedly uh, declared that we have a political belief uh, that we have an ideological leaning what caused this uh, you know journey and uh, around 2018 i had decided that i would write it and that the, the reason was the same you know when because the other side was simply not ready to say well played uh, uh, you know, because, because I, uh, I, I uh, faking news was one of the very popular social media handles. I was invited to you know many many uh, uh, these uh, small panel debates that happens on 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 television, and and so say many of these celebrity journalists, say Barkhade, Rajdeep, even Ravish Kumar, and all that. They they would they would definitely be aware about my existence. They would interact with me. Uh, on uh, Twitter, those who do that, for example, Barkha that is very active on Twitter. Now, one day she uh, she uh, wrote that you used to be funny, you know. So she was trying to kind of uh, uh, talk talk me down too that uh, that you have changed and and you have changed for worse. So now, those are the comments I don't take to the uh, to my heart because very much earlier I am an early adopter of uh, social media. I had realized that feedback is not something you know you take it really seriously. But that comment had a message that that you have changed, and and you that that is me. I was just 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 a placeholder. The fact is that in 2014, BJP saw a huge swing in favor. Now, why that happened, you know? And many people have written about that. I mean, even say Rajdeep Sadasai wrote a book which is titled 2014 Elections That Changed India. Uh, you know, and and it's supposed to be a watershed moment for most of the people, especially in journalism. Uh, many of them were not really, uh, you know, it, it came as a shock to them that BJP it, by itself will uh, have a majority. And for them, India changed. You know, the, which which is very much captured by the title of the book that Rajdeep Sadasai wrote. Uh, now, in in uh, now that that's obviously very very uh, important and event uh, uh, for the. Uh, you know the intelligentsia or the or the journalists, but what has been their reaction? You know they they they, they still have been trying to see it as uh, Amit Shah managed uh, Panna Pramukh kind of a thing, or it was because of IT cell and and they captured the social media narrative. You know the same kind of uh, uh, analysis is being thrown out because you know as if 2014 was a very artificial event engineered by. Uh, you know, uh, a political, um, they, they will not really say genius, but say a political um, uh, mind with, uh, with you know, a lot of uh, evil genius that uh, Amit Shah or Modi uh, might, be ha uh, might be having. Now, but that's not true. The fact that so many people changed, uh, so many people changed their vote, uh, 
does that really mean it was all about uh, simply electoral politics? It was not. And uh, that's what I tried to capture in my book. Uh, funnily, uh, <laughs> I, I didn't vote in 2014. So I cannot say that I changed my vote in 2014. But uh, the way I, and, and the kind of background that I come from, uh, I identified myself and which is I have written in my book also that I was a Congressy Hindu. So uh, and, and not only me, uh, my family, in fact, since we come from uh, Bihar, you cannot ignore caste. So me, my family and my caste, they were traditional voters of Congress. And now almost, you know, not only me and my family, but even my caste, uh, they support the BJP. So why why did that happen? What uh, it, It's not about one person. It's not about uh, one state. It's not about, uh, uh, you know, one campaign of, of any IT cell of or or of any Amit Shah or any Modi. Uh, it, it, it's it's a it, it, it's a social change that we are we are seeing and and everyone recognizes that. But the way people analyze it, the way people uh, interpret it is very different. And I thought that I should come up with uh, uh, an analysis or a perspective that is in a way autobiographical you know i mean i i could be a person who can be psychoanalyzed by others maybe even by say someone like mr badri narayan that okay why is this guy who was a nice uh, uh, joke cracking person suddenly becomes a vocal uh, proponent of hindutva or so called hindutva now i could be a subject of such an analysis but before someone else do, and, and many people else have done it, why not I go ahead and psychoanalyze myself? So bulk of the book is about that, that why I think I was a Congressy Hindu or why I think bulk of the uh, you know, people uh, or Hindus who were, who were not really uh, you know, typical uh, secular or liberal, I'm not using these words in, in truest meaning uh, that uh, they, are, they are supposed to uh, you know, convey, but in, in the political parlance, whatever they, uh, that's supposed to mean, uh, why those people suddenly shifted towards Hindutva. And bulk of the book actually, you know, it starts, it, it, it's written in form of my life journey, but it's not autobiography as such. Uh, every, almost every incident, uh, this is what the feedback also I have got that most people say that, oh, it looks like my story. You know, I, I mean, the exact details could be different, but they would have that, yeah, I also had something uh, somewhat of a similar experience. If I, I'm putting out, uh, you know, a, a particular uh, story of my childhood or, uh, or growing up, uh, uh, you know, during my uh, teenage and all that, they would also say, yeah, that similar thing happened with us. So it, it's, it's about, it's an autobiography of a generation, especially uh, people who, who were born and who grew up in the 80s and, and obviously gained uh, political or ideological uh, conscious in, in 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 around 90s and in early 2000 and even later also it's life is a continuous learning process but it's mostly deals with that generation uh, and how 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 they changed you know if, if that more than 10 percent of swing happened obviously some swing uh, political swing always happens in every election but this was not just 2014 was not just a political uh, swing. It was an ideological uh, journey that many people had uh, taken uh, from, uh, uh, you know, being uh, seen uh, from from someone who who takes Sanghi or or Hindutva guy as an offense to some to to finally coming to a point where you adopt this level as 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 something as a badge of honor almost, and you write a story saying uh, I am a Sanghi who never went to a shaka. So. So that was, uh, you know, uh, I mean, this is this is the background in which uh, I uh, decided to write this. Uh, so it, it's more about, you know, this change, why why it's happened. And in fact, half of the book, uh, uh, more more uh, more than half actually, is about why this change didn't happen earlier. Why Congressy Hindus remained Congressy Hindus, or why say, you know, RSS uh, or Sangh was not so mainstream earlier. It tries to, you know, kind of uh, 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 analyze that. Unlike Mr. Uh, Bhatri Narayan's book, I don't claim uh, to, you know, know Sun. In fact, that's that's uh, that's something that I have written upfront in the in the uh, in the introduction of the book, which you know, kind of preface uh, also one can say, and in the uh, uh, short note on the RSS that I write towards the end, that I have never, still as as we speak, I have never attended Ashaka. I am not a member of 
an RSS. At best, I have met, uh, you know, some uh, uh, supporters, some swam sevaks or some padadikaris, you know, what they called or the pracharaks and mid-level uh, office bearers of RSS. I still, uh, you know, don't really understand very well how Sangh, in a way, uh, operates. You know, so what Mr. Narayan is saying, I, I, I will not be able to contest or say that, you know, uh, I, I would disagree. But but the way he says that Sangh has changed, maybe, I, I don't know, uh, it, it could be right. Or maybe perhaps Sangh was never understood that well, you know, and, and later when, when we are seeing that change happening, we think that Sangh has changed. But perhaps no, it's, it's, it's their communication that's being received very differently now. And and the, and the factors for that could be not necessarily something uh, done by Sung very proactively, but because because of the technological changes, because of the narrative changes that has happened in the contemporary India, uh, especially around you know uh, 2009, 10 to 2015, 16. So that's a very crucial phase in my mind uh, for for the narrative to have changed, where RSS gained a lot of uh, acceptance in the mainstream. And why, how, uh, obviously, you know, and, and many, many more things uh, have been touched upon, uh, you know, like the caste politics uh, be, coming from Bihar. Obviously, I cannot ignore that. So, so I make a point that why, uh, even though the supposedly Mandal politics was uh, supposed to checkmate Kamandal politics, but why I think actually it ended up helping Kamandal politics. So that's that's something uh, I, uh, you know, I try to. Uh, I, I have uh, tried to analyze and also, uh, you know, I have tried to analyze this whole idea of why, uh, you know, say anyone, anyone with, uh, uh, say, some, someone like me, why, why I'm branded a Sangi or why, why anyone with, with uh, any bit of assertive uh, Hindu identity is, uh, you know, they, they are maligned, they are ostracized and they are not welcome into what we, uh, what I call the Congress left ecosystem. Or the all the secular liberal ecosystem. Why that happened? Uh, you know, these are some uh, some kind of uh, analysis uh, through anecdotes that I have uh, thrown. And uh, initial response has been pretty good. And I am uh, here, obviously, very happy to discuss the book or anything uh, regarding that. Thank you, thank you, Rahul ji. I must say that the book is uh, very absorbing, very readable, and very witty as well. I mean. Uh, and it has anecdotes, as you say, about all kinds of people, you know, some of the uh, top people in the world of journalism and politics, they all enter into it. And the detailing is absolutely splendid. You know, I remember there's an anecdote uh, about, uh, you know, Mr. Kanchan Gupta and uh, Shashi Tharoor somewhere in the middle of the book about traveling in cattle class, right. which uh, really made it, you know, it made it became viral on Twitter. So it's about social media, there's radio tapes, it's all kinds of stuff there. But now we're going to throw it open. Please send me your questions in the chat box, uh, you know, friends. I just wanted to say one thing, though, even about uh, uh, Badriji's book. You no, know, all these three books look at this phenomenon in a way from the outside, not from the inside. So it's not as if, I mean, he's looking at what's happening, uh, you know, in the ground. Uh, and the changes. And the other thing is that all three books are documenting precisely the change you spoke about, uh, Badriji. All, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, Rahulji. All three books are documenting the sea change in India. It's a social change, it's a political change, it's a cultural change. And you might even say it is a civilizational reorientation. We don't know. I mean, we don't have enough distance yet, but. You know, these are watershed changes. All three books are trying to make sense of them. And all three books have certain cautionary elements thrown in that uh, what if, you know, etc. Like how far, you know, this far and no further. The other thing that all three books are trying to talk about is also the crisis in what we called, you know, the Nehruvian consensus, liberalism, whatever. Uh, so now let's, uh, let's uh, uh, you know, I'm waiting uh, for people to raise questions. I know many people have to leave at five. Certainly, I know that Professor Badri Naran has to leave at five. So what I'll do now is the first round of questions can be uh, by the authors to each other. 
Uh, can you hear me at all, or are we, uh, or are we going through an internet glitch? Can, you, can anybody hear me? Yeah, yeah you are audible, audible but not yes. visible. We are audible. You are audible. Yes, not visible. Yes. Yeah. Makranji. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think we had a bit of an internet glitch. So I was going to say that uh, we can uh, have a first round where the three authors, if they have anything to ask each other, let's do that. Uh, one quick okay. round of that, uh, uh, you know. Uh, if any one of you three has something to ask of the other, okay. I would uh, you know, welcome that rather what than about, yeah. saying just about your own book. If you want to ask a question to your fellow author and panelists, please go ahead. MKR, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, Professor Bhagirinarayan, just one question about uh, the thing of defection. Yeah, body defection into the, into the right brain. Does it alter the ideology? Does it ideological dilution? What do you think? I'm not so able to uh, listen to you clearly. Uh, yeah, say it yeah. again. Say it again. Say it again, please. No. Hey. Defection from some party, say from DMC. Defection from say the DMC to the BJP or to the uh, to the to the Brigade, uh, right? Does it amount to dilution of ideology of Hindutva? Okay, uh, okay, I will repeat the question for everyone. We notice in the rise of BJP its capacity to absorb people from opposition parties, and sometimes, like in Assam, they become almost kingmakers. The, the key drivers of the toppling of the opposition, and we are seeing that with Suvendu and so forth, G, right now in Bengal. So, the question is. Is, is welcoming defections and defectors going to dilute the ideology of Hindutva? Badriji, go ahead. Uh, see, uh, it's a very, uh, very good question, uh, Raghavinji. Uh, you know, it's a de democracy. Democracy creates a kind of backdrop in which you have to play. So, uh, Hindutva, BJP is a party who works on the Hindutva line. And, and and they are working in the same way the other democratic parties are working. So bringing them together uh, does not mean that they are going to dilute their ideology. Or they, they don't have that kind of fixed ideology also. You know? As I said, they always keep evolving, changing uh, based on the situation and location. Uh, you, you can see the entire history of, uh, of uh, BJP uh, resigned even in 10 years. You can see the changes, you know, the way they have changed their position. So, so they have a capacity to, to, to okay. include appetite, and that's the strength of them. And, and that was with Congress also. Once Congress was uh, in a similar way, no, uh, absorbing, including, changing itself, no. So, so it's happened in the democratic politics. So, democracy is the key factor behind all these changes, and we need to understand the play of democracy, which we usually don't. Uh, uh, understand and we fix uh, uh, democracy with our ideology. No? Democracy should work like this yeah, because right, our right, right. like this. Can I make a remark? One remark. Yeah, just, just one second. Just one second. I, I just wanted to come in for a second here. You know, earlier on in the Vajpayee regime, we used to call it the Congressy Karan of BJP and the Bhagwa Karan of Congress because, you know, this is the interpenetration of opposites. Now, when people start going to temples and wearing the Agnopavet and all that, the other side wants to capture some of those points of appeal. You know, but it's what the, the thing that I wanted to focus on here for just a second is, is anyhow, I won't come in now. Let, let me take another question, um, Raghavendra. I'll come back into it later. That is the Congress, that is originally emerged as a party of consensus, uh, as against the party, party of pressures from outside, right? Actually, I think the Congress was an analog of Hinduism. It was, I think, you know. But subsequently, when they started this communal thing and with Hanusik or communal thing and all that, they became kind of monolithic in some sense, which they weren't earlier. Correct. Yeah. Agree. You know, in fact, there is. 
Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, in fact, there's work on this that, uh, you know, people ask, why did the Congress lose its appeal? And the answer is the Congress ceased to be a Hindu party and so it lost its appeal. So, you know, it's a way to explain the rise of Hindutva, uh, except that the difference is that Congress was a covertly Hindu party and now we have an overtly Hindu party, you know, etc. So, but it's the same same point about the interpenetration of opposites, uh, you know, and that uh, consensus building is a part of democracy. You can't get away from it. Uh, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Badriji. I, I'm sorry. I, I go ahead. Yeah, you are right. No, no, you have you have cleared the you have cleared the position. But I will tell you one example which will make which will clear this uh, entire Suhal Dev story, which uh, uh, Makranji was mentioning. He said we have worked on that. In fact, it is started by Congress. Congress in the 50s, they started demand of making a statue of Suhal Dev in Baharaj and Ram Raj Parishad joined with them, a section of Congress. So, so uh, uh, the, the thing which was invented by them, after a certain time it became communal for them. So, it's, 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 it tells the shift and the BJ, RSS and BJP who are not in their story, they appeared and they picked up that narrative. They made that narrative. Uh, their own and they played it in a larger way. That's exactly. You know, I, I want to say, and there's a question from uh, for Badriji, which I'll raise from uh, one of our fellows. But what I wanted to say is look at what you said, uh, uh, MKR, that the Congress started getting narrower and narrower, so much that it got identified with only one family. And the BGP jumped in and started appropriating all the icons of the Congress. Look at Sardar Patel, the tallest statue in the world. Look at, uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, Subhash Chandra Bose. Uh, you know, look at Ambedkar. So all the, uh, you know, uh, icons, national icons that the Congress claim to have monopoly over, the BJP is taken and now it's happening with Gandhiji. There's a, there's a very important book, uh, you know, edited by Jitendra uh, Bajaj and MD Srinivas. And it's it's all about the Hindu Gandhi, you know, Gandhi as a Hindu patriot. That's the title of the book. But it's a very, actually, it's a very good book because it's all about Gandhiji's own writings rearranged in a certain way. So the idea, the idea is that you you uh, you know, you are you are uh, stepping into a vacuum. Suhail Dev is a way to step into a vacuum where uh, you know some of these icons have no space, whether they are Dalit icons, whether they are icons of resistance to a perceived foreign invade, whatever. Anyhow, here's the question, and then there's, a, there's some questions from Rahul, for Rahulji also. So, here, somebody has read your work, uh, Badriji, and they say that aap koi, you know, nirnay pe nahi pahunchte, kya ye palayan nahi hai? Actually, uh, that's the a struggle of an academician. Tell the things without taking a position. So you can see the position. Position but uh, mostly academician uh, like me, like uh, Makaranji, always become um, Raghavanji, always become very cautious while telling it. You are not pamphleteers in that way, active, which we have heard. Uh, we are very proud of that. We are very proud of that. Go ahead. लेकिन, sorry. लेकिन ये पलायन नहीं है. लेकिन ये पलायन, पलायन नहीं है. ये एक confrontation है situation से and confrontation को कहने का एक अपना तरीका है. कहते ना कहते हैं गालिब का अंदाज़े बनाया कुछ और. कहने को तो दुनिया में सुखनवर बहुत अच्छे. तो वो एक अंदाज़े बनाया है. मैं मैं बल्कि है. उसमें आप चाहेंगे तो दूसरा � क्योंकि कोई सोचता है अरे ये तो एकदम संघी बन गया और दूसरा सोचता है ये तो संघी है ही नहीं है तो गद्दारे के अंदर घुस गया सो यू नो एक तो लोगों को पढ़ना ही नहीं आता यू नो दिस इज आर प्रॉब्लम पीपल डोंट नो हाउ टू रीड you know, like uh, to look at Raghavendra, he's being attacked for something he never said. You know, just because his book is called Hindu Nation, people are jumping. 
वो भी एक चुकी माहौल बहुत अच्छा हो रहा है इसलिए मैं कह दे रहा हूँ अदरवाइज में नहीं कहता जब ये किताब आई तो मैं पोएट हूँ जैसा इन्होंने बताया मेरे 40-40 वर्ष के पुराने दोस्त इनके साथ हमने बचपन बिताई एल कविता की बचपन जी आ, वो इतनी गालियां देने लगे और कोई कह फासिस्ट हो गया कोई कहने लगा पता नहीं क्या क्या और बड़े बड़े पदों पर बैठे हुए लोग रिटायर हुए हैं मतलब मुझे लगा कि ये कहते ना चाकू को इतना भोथरा बना के मारो कि वो बहुत दर्द करते इसको मरने के पहले अरे भाई थोड़ा अच्छे चाकू से साफ चाकू से मार दो जल्दी मर जाएंगे तो दैट काइंड ऑफ सिचुएशन मुझे लगता है कि क्या इंटेलेक्चुअल फ्रीडम इतनी बात करते हैं हम लोग डू यू हैव इंटेलेक्चुअल फ्रीडम इन दिस कंट्री टू टेल आवर ओन थी हमारे कहने की छूट है या पढ़ने की वो जो बहुत अच्छी बात की तो मैं यही कहता था लोगों से अपने साथ के लोगों से कि भाई पढ़ने का भी एक डिसिप्लिन होता है और पढ़ने का भी एक अनुशासन होता है कैसे किसी टेक्स्ट को पढ़ा जाए तभी आप उसका सही मीनिंग निकाल सकते हैं नहीं तो मैंने अगर कहा कि बीजेपी प्रोजेक्टेड नरेंद्र मोदी आई सोशल लीडर आप कह देंगे कि बद्री ने कहा सोशल लीडर है और फिर आप मुझे मारने लगेंगे कि भाई आप वो सोशल लीडर कह रहे हैं आप उनको तो ये ये अलग अलग तरह से पढ़ने का अनुशासन पढ़ना इज ऑल्सो एन आर्ट एंड डिसिप्लिन और वो और वो हमें करना पड़ेगा अगर एक अच्छा पब्लिक स्फेयर इंडिया में हम चाहते हैं इस वेरी वाइब्रेंट पब्लिक स्फेयर वी नीड टू डू दैट बट अनफॉर्चुनेटली वी लाइक टेंडेंसी इन आवर पब्लिक इन दोनों तरफ है यानी वेन आई बिकेम डायरेक्टर दो साल मुझे जो राइट फ्रिंज है वो मुझे गालियाँ देता रहा क्योंकि इनको कैसे डायरेक्टर बना दिया ये तो लेफ्टिस रहे हैं ये तो ये रहे हैं ये तो वो रहे हैं तमाम तरह की गालियाँ वो और जब ये उतार पर है जब वेन आई रोड दिस बुक तो लेफ्ट गाली देने लगा तो आप जाओगे कहा वेर विल गो यानी of uh, those who say that uh, you know whatever this is the divider in chief now anyhow here's a question for uh, uh, rahul ji what kind of functionality related differences have you experienced when you were running faking news and op india now i i, I don't know if the question is clear but go ahead <laughs> Uh, i i would actually i would prefer if you would make a little clearer <laughs> yeah okay i mean the okay. point is when you were when you were running faking news uh hmm. did you did you face a different kind of uh, challenge than when you were running op end functionality yeah. related yeah. i think that's how i see it yeah but, so uh, uh, but abhishek ji uh, sorry uh, akhilesh ji do you want to say something here आपको कुछ कहना है तो कह सकते हैं नो प्रॉब्लम मेरा क्वेश्चन फंक्शनैलिटी रिलेटेड कॉन्टेक्स्ट में ही है आई थिंक राहुल सर को समझ आ गया होगा किसका रिलेटेड कॉन्टेक्स्ट सॉरी मैं फंक्शनैलिटी uh... कह रहे हैं अच्छा, मतलब आप एक वेबसाइट चला रहे हो जो कि नॉन पॉलिटिकल है ह्यूमर से रिलेटेड है तो वो उसके टाइम पे फंक्शन करते टाइम और एक वेबसाइट है जो हाईली पॉलिटिकल वेबसाइट है तो उस उसमें क्या डिफरेंस है हाँ बिल्कुल एक्सपीरियंस हुए हाँ मतलब जैसे आपके सवाल में ही एक तरीके से जवाब जवाब छुपा है क्योंकि नेचर ऑफ वेबसाइट्स दोनों की नेचर दोनों की बहुत अलग है और एक तरीके से फंक्शनल रोल भी मेरा अलग है यहाँ पर मैं बिजनेस हेड हूँ वहाँ पे ऑलमोस्ट हर Uh, मतलब दस में से छह आर्टिकल या एक वक्त था कि आठ या नौ आर्टिकल मैं ही लिखता था तो वो फेकिंग न्यूज की जब, जब मैं बात कर रहा हूँ तो इस, उस हिसाब से मेरा वो रोल भी काफी डिफरेंस है तो uh, वो ऑब्वियस डिफरेंसेस तो हैं लेकिन चूंकि हम यहाँ वो बुक के कॉन्टेक्स्ट में और सोशियो पॉलिटिकल uh, के कॉन्टेक्स में अगर हम बात करें और उस, उस परिप्रेक्ष में अगर मैं देखू तो और यू नो एक्चुअली वन ऑफ द फर्स्ट थिंग जिससे जहाँ जो कि मेरे बुक के इंट्रोडक्शन में भी आता है वो इंटरेस्टिंगली वो फेकिंग न्यूज के दौरान ही हुआ था 
कि जो मैंने फेकिंग न्यूज के दौरान एक अरुंधति रॉय को एक ओपन लेटर लिखा था ये आई थिंक 2010-11 के आसपास की बात थी जब 2010 में सीआरपीएफ के जो 72 या 74 लोग मारे गए थे उसके बाद कश्मीर में अनरेस्ट हुआ था और वहां अरुंधति राय गई थी और उसके बाद इनपे सेडिशन का चार्ज वगैरह लगने की भी बात हुई थी पी चिदम्बरम तम होम मिनिस्टर थे तो उस वक्त इन्होंने और उस, उस वक्त तो ऑब्वियसली कांग्रेस और अरुंधति रॉय आमने सामने थी तो उस वक्त मैंने अरुंधति रॉय को एक तरीके से मॉक करता हुआ एक ओपन लेटर लिखा था बिकॉज आई वॉज एटरिस्ट आई वॉज ए ह्यूमरिस्ट तो उसमें बहुत ज्यादा पॉलिटिक्स या आइडियोलॉजी और उस वक्त तक मैं बहुत ज्यादा पॉलिटिक्स और आइडियोलॉजी में घुसा भी नहीं था तो वो उस तरह का एक ओपन लेटर था लाइफ में मुझे पहली बार जो ये ट्रोलिंग और ये हेट मैसेज की ये सब बात हुई होती है ये पहली बार मुझे ये लेफ्ट की तरफ से हुआ क्योंकि ऐसा लगा उनको कि जैसे ब्लास्फेमिक कर दिया मैंने कि आपने अरुंधति रॉय को के बारे में कुछ चीज ऐसी क्यों लिख दी जिससे उनका जो यू नो वट एवर शी शी हैड सेड उसको आप मॉक कर रहे हो उसको एक तरीके से आप दिखा रहे हो कि शी वॉज नॉट सीरियस और शी वॉज नॉट लॉजिकल तो अजीब अजीब तरह के मुझे मुझे पहली बार फैन मेल्स तो मुझे आते थे कि बड़ा अच्छा लिखा पढ़ के हंसी आ गई टेंशन दूर हो गया लेकिन पहली बार मुझे हेट मेल्स और क्या क्या नहीं आए तो वो एक तरीके से आप यू कैनोट सेपरेट पॉलिटिक्स फ्रॉम यू नो एनी फॉर्म ऑफ आर्ट यू नो एक बहुत ही ये एक यू नो आई मीन बहुत लोग कह देते हैं कि लेट्स कीप पॉलिटिक्स एंड आर्ट सेपरेट आई डोंट थिंक इट्स पॉसिबल एनी फॉर्म ऑफ आर्ट इज वेरी मच इंटरमिक्स विथ पॉलिटिक्स एंड जो जिस तरह का पॉलिटिकल uh, सटायर uh, या सोशल सटायर आप लिखते हैं तो उससे उसमें पॉलिटिक्स को सेपरेट करना तो काफी मुश्किल हो जाता है तो इन दैट सेंस यू नो थिंग्स वे आर नॉट टू डिफरेंट कि uh, अगर कोई भी पॉलिटिकल कमेंट्री करूं मैं अगर कोई भी पॉलिटिकल सटायर लिखूं मैं तो लगभग उसी तरह के रिएक्शन आते थे या तो लोगों को बहुत अच्छा लगेगा या फिर लोग बिल्कुल कहेंगे कि ये बकवास है यू आर ट्राइंग टू मिसलीड पीपल एंड ऑब्वियसली दैट दैट्स व्हेन आई वाज फर्स्ट कॉल्ड संगी आई मीन आई वाज कॉल्ड आई वाज नेवर कॉल्ड अ संगी आई मीन ऑब्वियसली जब मैं ऑफ इंडिया और ये सब कर रहा हूं तो हमारी आइडियोलॉजिकल लीनिंग्स आर आउट इन ओपन ऑब्वियसली आप मेरे को संगी क्या कहोगे मैं तो खुद ही कह रहा हूं लेकिन जब पहली बार मुझे संगी कहा देन आई वाज लीडिंग अ सटायर पोर्टल एंड आई आई हैड एब्सोल्युटली नो आईडिया एंड आई आई टुक दैट एज अ character assassination i blocked that person on twitter so in that sense of uh, you know uh, a functional difference mein dekha jaye to uh, reactions same hi hote hain lekin uh, jo business aspects hai jo operational aspects hai wo to obvious hai ki kafi different hota hai uh, when when you compare a website like taking news and of india ye yaad aa raha hai listening to you that uh, i've often thought that this civil war is not characterized by a fight between tolerance and intolerance but between two kinds of intolerance and True. two kinds <laughs> of tolerance you know so i want to read an excerpt from rahul ji's book here uh, he says on page 2, 308 the hindutva camp will do good by not becoming intolerant like the wokes and copy the cancel culture they should also make sure that they don't become the caricature of what the left projects them to be inherently supremacist and violent with no regard for personal liberty so i think that uh, what i find you know the common thread in all the three books is that each of the authors is standing up uh, for their own kind of uh, freedom of expression liberalism a safe space Badri ji just said look i'm an academic and uh, i want to be free to say what i want to say what is my truth and say it in the way that i choose to say it you know and not be pushed to the wall and say ab batao kaun se side mein ho is pe batao us pe batao no that's not you know what our job is and uh, so in that sense i mean the uh, we'd like at iis to create a safe space where you know every stripe and every color every shade of opinion has a chance to express itself and and the point is i believe we we stand for the truly open public culture you know where there can be polite disagreement uh, uh, without you know the witch hunt the knives the long knives coming out uh, you know later on so anyhow 
somehow nobody seems to have any questions now. So uh, I, I once again turn it to the panelists. If you have a question, go ahead for each other, uh, or else we'll go into the wind up mode. Uh, does does any one of the panelists have something to say to e to each other? Badriji, Mike, Mike. Uh, I have to share one of my experience, which uh, not with the panelists uh, themselves, but with all of the audience. And that my experience uh, uh, of uh, it's again my autobiographical mode. When I started writing, working on Dalits, I used to receive phone from the Kerala. Are you Dalit? Uh, I said, no, I am not Dalit. Are you OBC? I am sorry, no, no, I am not OBC. Have you married with a Dalit, uh, uh, Dalit woman? I said no. Then why you are write, how you are writing so beautiful on the or, or, or the uh, nice writing on the on the net? So so, so I, did, I then I, uh, when I wrote this book, <laughs> so people say uh, you are from Hindutva. You are so who am I? I am I, I am Chamar. No, uh, they also used to say one of the Congress leader who was a deputy, who was a very big leader in Uttar Pradesh. Someone went to uh, was sitting with him and he said that I want to meet him. अरे उससे क्या मिलोगे तो चमार है चमार है इसलिए yeah. दलित पर लिखता है और मायावती के करीबी है तो तो अब who am I no that's the question uh, uh, we always raise while doing our academics or our, while doing our journalists बहुत मिहिबती होते हैं नो they can वो uh, courts को भी लड़ लेते हैं थाना को भी लड़ लेते हैं but academics like me हम लोग बहुत uh, प्रजा वो एक तरह से vulnerable भी होते हैं और हमें उन लड़ना uh, नहीं आता तो हमें बहुत मुश्किल होती है यानी हमारी जो डगर है अनघट की वो बहुत व्हिच इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट एंड आई एम जस्ट शेयरिंग यू एट दिस मोमेंट दिस कि कल अगर मैं कांग्रेस कल मान लीजिए प्रियंका गांधी की राजनीति बहुत वाइब्रेंट हो जा रही है एंड आई आई एनालाइज अ राइट ऑन द पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ रिवाइविंग कांग्रेस कांग्रेस कैसे एक रिवाइव कर रही है कि कोई कहेगा देखिए कांग्रेस का हो गया तो दलित भी हो गया you know this this is this is academic any academic see jo change document karta hai see this is this is very important because one's primary identity you know ye jo subject position of an academic has been a matter of great debate you know especially in the west can you represent you know someone or some group uh, without belonging to that you know the academic and so forth but i mean this this whole problematic has been exaggerated precisely because of the politics identity politics which gets mixed up with academics you know what is the subject position of an academic the subject position of an academic is academics so you know when people were criticizing uh, badri ji to me they said you know what his name is badri narayan tiwari but he hides tiwari because he wants to pretend he's a dalit <laughs> i have heard all kinds of things but you know i want to also point to one more thing uh, what uh, what raghavendra says in his book on page 260 so so he says that since we live in the global age india has to be in tune with the rest of the world and whatever knowledge is held about it in hinduism cannot be changed overnight by changing curricula before something new is taught it will have to be established through study and validated globally so what he is making a very important point that there's actually no shortcut to legitimacy it's not just a matter of you know having a stronger narrative or counter narrative and creating uh, you know an army uh, you know of trolls or an army in social media because when before something is established it's constantly tested and validated and revalidated and you know uh, the protocols of knowledge that's the point the protocols of knowledge cannot be changed overnight you can't say oh our ancient muni said it so it must be true i mean that kind of argument uh, will only work in a certain very small group of already converted people so the real point again i see as a common uh, link between the three books is that uh, you know uh, political change is sometimes faster than uh, cultural intellectual or uh, or or even social change and and uh, 
some of these changes need a lot of hard work. I just recorded uh, a conversation yesterday and someone was saying, how can we improve the quality, you know, of research in humanities and social studies? And I said, look, you'll have to, you know, incentivize good research and you'll have to create thousands of, you know, good PhDs and then a few you might expect to be game changers, you know, but right now we are doing just the opposite. You know, our, our universities are going down and there's an institutional crisis across the country. And so there are basically what I'm trying to say is that coming back to the clash of narratives, there's no shortcut when it comes to academics. You know, <clears throat> you know when 200 books are written, then two or three will be good. And the bench strength uh, that that we need in order to have an alternate point of view become the mainstream requires many decades of hard work. So, uh, friends, uh, what I'm going to do now is we are in the wind up mode. I want to give each of the panelists about two or three minutes to sum up and then uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, offer a vote of thanks. If you were here, we would have offered you a cap and shawl as we do in Himachal, but we will, uh, we will collect later. <laughs> Please, please <laughs> invite all of you again. But uh, Badriji, we'll start with you since you have to go first. Just about two or three minutes to sum up what you were uh, trying to do in the book. Uh, and uh, uh, also, you know, comment on whatever has happened so far in the uh, discussion. First of all, uh, I, I feel very comfortable in this discussion. No? It's, uh, uh, and because of Makaran, you know, Makaran made the uh, entire universe very comfortable and very interactive. Uh, secondly, he has already uh, summarized uh, 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 the things which I, I want to tell. No? The art of reading is very important while understanding this kind of work. And since we are dealing with the politics, no? because dealing with direct politics is is, is very difficult. No? Uh, their uh, uh, narrative becomes very important. Because you will have to uh, protect, uh, save yourself from giving any value judgment. Uh, when postmodernism came, we were pretty happy. This is the time I come out from the Versailles entire, you know, uh, so many discourses about binary apologies. And when you try to come out from the binary apologies, then people will push you that you go back and say the things. Because we are habitual of our own habit. We are slave of our own habit. Argument. First struggle come out from that habit of uh, of uh, slave being slave of our own habit and try to evolve ourselves. The way politics evolve, actually we should learn. I always say that we should we should learn from the politicians. They are very sharp in evolving themselves because they have very good contact with the people. But academicians takes long time to evolve, and they don't because changeability seems very bad in academics. If you have changed your position, you will be called opportunist. No, you are opportunist. Hai, um, uh, but politicians uh, don't bother, no, because they will have to interact with the public. When you do field work and when you will be too much contact with the people, uh, you will fail to evolve your change yourself. And if you would not change, then it will be injustice with your own intellectual understanding. And and that's the dilemma which we always face as education. So only one request I will do with you. While reading this book, be uh, very uh, uh, so read this book very patiently and uh, with a discipline, discipline of reading, uh, and 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 don't be uh, 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 impatient to, to to put your own conclusion and and bring our uh, narrative in your own uh, uh, playground, play batting for to do batting for you. So so the only uh, this thing I will have to say. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, when you will read the book, if you have any question, kindly feel free to ask me through mail or through phone number. Uh, everything uh, um, uh, is with the IS, so you can interact with me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Badriji. Uh, go ahead, uh, Raghavendra. I, I learned uh, something with, uh, on the recording. I love but my, uh, my basic thing is that, uh, you know, uh, religious identity is here to stay. 
it's it's a stronger uh, thing than the political identity even right the communism made way for uh, you know in poland it could not be the ussr could not absorb poland because of catholicism in poland as against okay so this thing of religion is very strong issue and uh, the hindutva for the hindutva is here to stay that it's not going to go away in our age it's here to stay and you have to understand that the, the identity of being a hindu is generally forced upon all of us indians okay and but the point is you have to work at the global level do the intervention of intellectual study of the religion study of local culture study of local languages conserve local knowledge and all this but for that you need the uh, we say mediation intervention of intellectuals it's absolutely necessary i mean uh, intellectuals are like us they will say very well, immodestly that we are uh, we are un unaffiliated we are prepared to look at things we are prepared to look at things of christ we are prepared to take an independent path right this is necessary so once we do that probably i mean to enlarge the thing to i know it might all kind of other things in into the fold then probably you know it will be probably be easier for uh, in the hinduism the three god has got some way to go before it gets accepted yeah it seems to be that is my general sense yeah that is sense of yeah. thank you so much rahul ji uh, right uh, uh, you know i mean uh, to summarize uh, the book uh, my book obviously as as i told earlier it, it's more of a uh, uh, you know analysis and explanation from a first uh, uh, first person account on why say what we saw in 2014 and then again a repeat of it in 2019 it's not an artificially engineered thing you know not by some uh, it cell thing or by paid thing and obviously if you go into a conspiracy theory zone then evm hacked no nothing is artificial about it it's a very natural process that's happening a natural change that has happened and that that analysis that documentation of the change uh, uh, uh you know kind of understanding that why that change happened is what i'm trying to do in my book and and you have actually actually summarized in the, you know that phrase that i like very much it's a clash of narratives that we are uh, you know witnessing and especially towards the later part of my book that is that becomes very evident the first part of the you know almost 60% of my book is told in retrospect with a, with a new insight gained about uh, you know why people like uh, us we are not never sanghis or we are never comfortable with sanghis but where this clash of narratives come and where in which uh, direction it's going uh, our understanding of that becomes very important and uh, i think you know my book is just a example of that clash of narratives that you were talking about and uh, uh, this this is a wonderful phrase that you know perhaps uh, we should be more talking about we should be more discussing about to understand you know i mean at one point of time the clash of civilization was a buzzword in the socio you know i mean in, in the in intellectual circles but this is very important this is what i think is uh, uh, is happening not just in india but in abroad also but the clash of narratives you have aptly summarized thank you uh, i must say uh, that uh, i really enjoyed not just this discussion but uh, the insights that came out of it what badri ji said uh, you know the ethics of reading as well as the discipline of reading very important point what uh, uh, mkr said that hindutva is not going to go away uh, uh, so we must uh, try to understand it the importance of intellectuals uh in a democracy regardless of uh, what uh, happens in the sphere of politics and what rahul ji said that we have to think about the clash of narratives not just the clash of civilizations and i think that uh, these three really fine books very well written very well uh, i think substantiated reference books uh, badri ji's book i can't hold up unfortunately but he can hold it up now for you i recommend them i think we should read and engage with them and uh, i wish all the three authors you know lots and lots of sales royalties publicity good and bad comments reviews i also wish them uh, good luck in their next writing project because i know each one of them 
they don't stay still. They're always moving. They're always thinking. They're always writing. And uh, with writers and thinkers and authors such as these, I feel very proud uh, of our own public sphere in India. I think it's healthy. And um, I must say that democracy by any name, you know, remains a democracy and has, uh, I think, obligations on all of us uh, to continue these discussions, to continue these debates, to continue, uh, you know, talking to one another and listening to one another. And uh, most importantly, reading, citing and commenting on one another. Thank you very much with these words. I thank all our three speakers and uh, thank you all for joining in, both the fellows of the Institute and those who are listening to us from the outside. Till we meet again, bye-bye. Oh, oh, oh.